Hello there and welcome back to A Course in Cognitive Linguistics. In the last episode, the first one, I asked four questions trying to define cognitive linguistics. So I asked, how does it relate to psycholinguistic work? Um, is it part of functional linguistics? Is it all about metaphors? Well, we'll talk more about metaphors in this episode. Uh, and my fourth question was, is it anti-Chomskyan? Now, if you're interested in these questions, here's the link to the last episode, so you can click on that and watch it if you want to. All right, in this episode, I'll talk about conceptual metaphor theory, which is a big issue in cognitive linguistics. Now, it all started out with this book here, Metaphors We Live By, Lakoff and Johnson, 1980. And if you haven't had this book in your hands, I strongly recommend that you check it out, you know, go to your library, uh, read it, or at least part of it. It doesn't read like a research monograph. It really reads more like a general audience book. And I think that is what made it so successful. So it's cited a gazillion times and it basically founded a field, the field of conceptual metaphor research. Okay, so what's it all about? Um, I try to summarize the book in one short sentence. And, well, not me actually, I took a short sentence from Lakoff and Johnson, uh, who state that the essence of metaphor is understanding one kind of thing in terms of another kind of thing. So the revolutionary, okay, not revolutionary, it was present in earlier theories, but what is definitely a hallmark of conceptual metaphor theory is that it's not about words, it's about thought, yeah? So metaphor is thinking, understanding one kind of thing, usually a complex abstract thing, in terms of another thing, usually a very concrete or um, very simple to understand kind of thing. Okay, let me give you a few examples uh, of this kind of understanding of metaphor. This is a slide that you've already seen in the last episode. This is Lakoff and Johnson's argument is war example. The idea that we understand um, having an argument, having a verbal uh, disagreement in terms of war. So we're using war vocabulary uh, to talk about this arguably quite abstract situation that you have when you engage in an argument with somebody else. Um, so we're talking about two domains. Those are the things that are understood. Yeah? The target domain is the abstract thing that you're trying to understand. The source domain is the more concrete thing that you're using as a source for your vocabulary to talk about this target domain. And then between the source domain and the target domain there are these mappings so that, for instance, fighting parties in a war are mapped onto the participants of an argument. Attacking is mapped on raising objections. Defending is mapped onto maintaining your opinion. And surrendering is mapped onto giving up your opinion. Okay, all of this is very much productive. Yeah, So you can take things from the war domain and apply them to the argument domain. For instance, imagine that there's a war and the army is encroaching on somebody else's territory, but there they are stopped. So in the argument frame, you could understand that as, okay, I'm conceding part of your point, but from here on, I'm going to stand my ground. Yeah. Um, right, let me just give you a few more examples of all of this. Uh, here are a few sentences, descriptions of diseases. Um, since 1998, the virus has invaded Southern and Central Europe, killing over 1.2 eight million animals so far. I don't remember whether that is the swine flu or the bird flu or some other kind of flu. Um, we are losing the fight against tuberculosis. He's been battling his disease with, with homeopathic medication. Uh, the spread of the deadly severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, is dealing a heavy blow to commercial activities in Taiwan. Okay, in these sentences you recognize uh, vocabulary like uh, invade losing the fight, battling, dealing a heavy blow. So again, we are basically using fighting vocabulary to talk about something very abstract like diseases. Okay, we know that diseases are caused by microorganisms, but nonetheless, since microorganisms are so hard to experience directly, we choose 
to use more concrete vocabulary, fighting vocabulary. So we conceptualize diseases as enemies so that you end up with a two-domain picture like this one here. Again, the source domain is war, and the target domain, the domain that we're trying to understand, that we're trying to talk about, is the domain of diseases, so that enemies or invaders of the war domain are mapped onto the germs and viruses of the disease domain. Attacking and invading is mapped onto infection or the spread of a disease. Fighting the disease is uh, trying to heal. Uh, ammunition is medication. And victory from the war domain maps onto recovery from disease in the disease frame. One more example. Scientific disciplines, another very abstract uh, topic. So uh, she has published widely in the field of cognitive psychology. My dissertation straddles the line between linguistics and philosophy. This article goes beyond the traditional boundaries of particle physics. And this finding has opened up entirely new areas of research. And you recognize words like the field of something or straddles the line between, goes beyond the boundaries of or um, opens up new areas. Okay, what you see in these sentences is that scientific disciplines, which are something very abstract, you know, it's a topic, it's uh, something that people think about, uh, we talk about these things as though they were areas in space. So you can be situated in the field of cognitive psychology, or when you're dealing with multiple subject matters, multiple disciplines, you're sort of in between. You straddle the line between linguistics and philosophy, or you can go from linguistics to philosophy and back again. Um, or, uh, well, if you're lucky and you discover something new that might found a new discipline, you've discovered a new area. You know, you've opened up a new area of research, as, for instance, Lakoff and Johnson did in 1980. Fine. Uh, so here's the domain of space and the domain of science. An area in space maps onto a discipline in science. Being in a borderline region maps onto working on two disciplines or even more disciplines. Um, moving across boundaries means that you're changing disciplines and a discovery of a new territory means that you're making a scientific discovery. Okay, mm, what can I say about source domains and target domains? Usually source domains are from a handful of usual suspects. Space, force, manipulation, physical manipulation, vision, and to a certain extent also taste. Now, these are domains of direct bodily experience. I have a direct bodily experience of space as I move through space. Uh, I have a direct experience of force as I try to open doors or cans or uh, coffee jars or, you know, whatever uh, containers you're dealing with or <clears throat> you're trying to push something out of the way. So force is something that you know, you know how it works. Uh, manipulation, yeah, you manipulate things all the time in a good way, so you're using objects. Uh, vision, perception, that is direct as it can get, and taste also. So if you're looking at these source domains and the target domains that they map onto, it becomes apparent that quite often the target domain is a lot more abstract and um, less well-defined as the source domain. So if you say, well, that's a central idea, you're talking about importance in terms of space. Okay, So you're um, mapping things from the space domain uh, into the importance domain. <clears throat> uh, if you're talking about a strong candidate, yeah, competition is understood in terms of force. A strong candidate uh, is not the one that can lift, I don't know, um, a car uh, or, or something heavy, but rather a strong candidate is the one with the good CV. Uh, manipulation, you can turn something to your advantage. So you talk about social relations as though they were things, objects that you can physically manipulate. Um, if somebody gives you a clear explanation, you're talking about logical things as though they were things that you can see. And if something is a bitter disappointment, then you're verbalizing an emotion that is very complicated to explain. 
I, I, I've been in that situation, uh, with a taste that maybe is a little bit more concrete. So source domains, usually concrete and uh, experienceable with your body, with your perceptual apparatus. And abstract ideas, well, more complicated things, things that are difficult to understand, maybe things that are social or uh, logical, things like that. Okay, summing up what I've told you so far. Uh, conceptual metaphor is based on our capacity to think of and then talk about one thing in terms of another kind of thing. It involves a mapping of concepts yeah, from one semantic domain to another semantic domain. And why does this all happen? It helps us understand, or metaphorically speaking, get a grip on complex phenomena, unfamiliar topics, or any other less well-structured semantic domain. So Lakoff and Johnson uh, made this point time and again that metaphor is not something that is restricted to literary or poetic language. Rather, it's in our everyday language and it is so fundamental to our everyday language that language just couldn't function without metaphor. That's the big deal about conceptual metaphors. Okay, um, now, before we go on, I have to take a step back and uh, explain to you how metaphors were thought to believe before the advent of Lakoff and Johnson. Now, of course, there were tons of metaphor theories around there at the time, but here's one that was particularly dominant. And you recognize this gentleman here because I put his name down there, John Searle, philosopher, not only philosopher of language, um, superstar philosopher, full stop, great guy. He advanced something that uh, is called the literal meaning first hypothesis. That's not his label, but let's use this label. The literal meaning first hypothesis means that when you understand a metaphor, you first parse the literal meaning. And when you realize that, well, the literal meaning somehow doesn't work, there's something odd about this, but um, I trust my interlocutor uh, so far that I think, well, he, he's not just making things up. He's not just telling um, useless uh, things to me. He must mean something else. And so I figure that, oh, there must be some other metaphorical meaning. Let me give you an example. So here we have two friends engaged in friendly conversation. And one of them says, Sally is a block of ice. Okay. According to the literal first meaning first hypothesis, uh, the other speaker now engages in a cognitive process of thinking, okay, Sally is a block of ice. That is not true. I know Sally. I know she's human. So because I think that my partner is being cooperative, he wants to communicate something meaningful, he must mean something else. And he probably means that Sally is in some way like a block of ice. So. What he probably wants to say is that Sally is repellent, unpleasant to interact with, unresponsive, and so on and so forth. So literal meaning is computed first, and if literal meaning doesn't work, then go on to some metaphorical meaning. Okay. Um, conceptual metaphor theory stands this thing on its head and uh, argues for an understanding of metaphor where metaphorical meanings are understood directly. Okay, you may wonder, is that really true? If we have um, sentences such as, she gave me the cold shoulder, we received a warm welcome, I gradually warmed up to them, or she gave me an icy stare, do we really think about sympathy, which is talked about here, uh, in terms of temperature? In other words, does sympathy feel warm? Do we really think that sympathy feels warm or is this rather just a, well, a matter of words, a matter of phrasing things? So sympathy is a complicated thing to explain. So we use simpler vocabulary and sort of figure out something that sympathy really means. Well, um, by now there is a sizable body of really interesting and funny psychological research and I want to summarize some of that research. So there are experiments that suggest that sympathy actually feels warm and exclusion actually feels cold. So here's how the experiment went. Two groups of subjects were asked to perform a number of tasks. Yeah, 
things that psychologists usually ask people to do. I don't know, count matches or point out uh, the odd color thing, things like that. Um, and um, well, among these tasks were the following. So there were two groups. Uh, group A had to imagine a scene of social inclusion. Think of a time when you were together with friends and family and you felt really good. And group B had to imagine a scene of social exclusion. Can you remember an episode in your life where you felt left out, where your friends had abandoned you or the other kids at school were teasing you? That kind of thing. Uh, remember the time in physical education when nobody would have you on your team? That didn't feel nice, did it? Okay, so you now did both, basically. Um, after these two groups had completed all the tasks, the experimenter asked each subject to estimate the room temperature uh, with some, some shady excuse, like, you know, it's at the request of the lab maintenance staff. Uh, they, the guys want to know if the heating works, basically. So, uh, what's the temperature? What do you reckon? It turned out that the people in the two groups um, gave significantly different estimates. So, the group who imagined a scene of social inclusion gave warmer estimates, and the group who had imagined a scene of social exclusion gave lower estimates. Now, isn't that fantastic? So it means that the target domain, yeah, exclusion, exclusion, sympathy, antipathy, activates cognitively the source domain, so your perceptual apparatus of how warm or how cold you feel. Okay. Um, the cool thing is, this does not only work from target to source, but also from source to target. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I need to first tell you this, about a second experiment that shows the same thing. So um, here, participants were not only asked to imagine a scene of exclusion or inclusion, but rather they were literally subjected to social inclusion or exclusion. So psychologists are a cruel bunch. They do these kind of things to people. Um, they were playing, well, the participants were playing a computer game in which supposedly three players were connecting online to play ball. And uh, the exclusion group played a game in which they received the ball twice initially in the game, but not during the rest of the game. So they were basically sitting in front of the screen watching two computer uh, animated figures play the ball uh, back and forth between them. Uh, the inclusion group were more involved in the game. The test after the task was um, that the participants had to fill out desirability ratings for cold and hot drinks and food items. So, and here again, a significant uh, difference emerged. The exclusion group found hot food and drinks significantly more desirable than the inclusion group. So if you felt excluded for a while, you really long for that hot cup of cocoa. You do. I do. Um, okay, why is this important? Well, it shows that metaphorical target domains, the complex and abstract stuff, that can activate the respective source domains. And this really um, vindicates the idea of conceptual metaphor theory that metaphors are not just about language, they are about deeply ingrained patterns of association in thought. So exclusion can literally feel cold and create a need for physical warmth. So <clears throat> later in this course I'll talk about embodiment, how your knowledge of language, but also of things like social interaction, is embodied. Yeah? Thinking is very, very much connected to bodily experience. Okay, now we come to the thing that I wanted to uh, talk about already a few minutes ago, namely that this connection between source and target domain also works the other way around, that a source domain can activate cognition in the target domain. In a sentence, holding a warm cup of coffee can make you feel more sympathetic towards others. Drink more coffee. So, um, how did this experiment work? Well, before the experiment, uh, subjects were uh, met in the lobby of a university building, and um, 
the experimenter met them and said, look, we have to go up uh, the elevator. And uh, so here's the elevator, come with me. And um, they were asked to hold the experimenter's drink while they were riding up in the elevator. Okay, so the experimenter had a bunch of papers and a, a drink and, you know, <clears throat> fiddled with the papers and said, oh, could you hold this for me uh, for a second? I, I need, so I can enter your name and everything. And, um, well, the crucial variable in this experiment was that there were, again, two groups um, that were holding different kinds of beverages. So in one scenario, the experimenter had a nice and warm cup of coffee, which uh, he or she asked the subjects to hold, and uh, in the other uh, condition, the experimenter had an icy cold can of soda. Right. Um, when people arrived at the top floor of the university building, they went out and did what they thought was the proper task. Namely, uh, they were asked to complete a personality assessment questionnaire. So basically, they were given a CV and a bunch of questions. How uh, competent is this person? How friendly are they? How intelligent? How trustworthy? That kind of thing. So now, interestingly enough, the same person, yeah, the same CV, was rated as more friendly, more intelligent, more competent by the coffee group. So just uh, by holding a warm cup of coffee, you somehow turn more sympathetic towards others. And this indicates that the source domain, warmth, activates the target domain, sympathy. Here's another version of the same experiment. And uh, the bottom line is that holding a hot pad makes you more generous towards others. So those of you who do psychology and haven't heard about uh, the, the, the coffee experiment, you might say, okay, the experimenter knew exactly about the condition, yeah? So maybe he was a little extra friendly to his coffee people and just a little more distanced uh, with the Coke people, yeah? So there, there's the possibility that this might have influenced the uh, subjects. So uh, in order to control for that, here's the second version of the experiment in which the experimenters didn't know whether the subjects were handling an icy a pad or a hot pad. Okay, so they just uh, had a box with these things sitting on the desk and then um, handing one out, um, not knowing which one it is, and the subjects tested these hot pads or icy pads, uh, holding them in their hands for a while, and uh, gave their assessment of how great or how boring or how whatever these pads are and later on they were sent home with a choice of either you know one reward or another and that was the crucial variable they could choose an ice cream for themselves or they could choose an ice cream gift certificate for a friend and guess what the hot group felt more generous yeah, they chose the gift certificate significantly more often than the IC group, uh, which you know, whose sympathy was curbed uh, with this icy, cold feeling. Okay, conclusions. Um, the study of conceptual metaphors started on the basis of offline linguistic evidence. People looking at sentences like the deadline is getting closer and closer. Let's put this disagreement behind us and observing that, hey, we're talking about time uh, using words from space. So we must think about time in terms of space. So the conclusion, abstract ideas, target domains are understood in terms of direct bodily experience, that is source domains, and hence abstract human thought is embodied. By now, there's really a substantial body of psychological evidence that lends support to this view. Now, I should say um, some of these studies um, don't replicate all too well. Yeah? So be sure to check back regularly, seeing whether people have tried to replicate these studies and what comes out there. Um, but nonetheless, um, there has been quite a lot of different things going on, different metaphorical mappings that have been put to the test. And uh, often enough, 
there are significant results that are reported. Okay, if you want to read up on all of this, there's a great book that has come out in uh, 2012 by Ben Bergen, Louder Than Words. It summarizes a lot of uh, what's been going on in the field, and it's, it's funny and entertaining and, and really great. I recommend it. Right, that's it for today. Next time, we'll talk about categorization and prototypes. I'll see you then.